Hi, Professor. No, I can't hear you. Now, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Sorry, I'm a boomer. So I, am, I do it from time to time. Okay. So, um, good afternoon. We start from uh, the results that we got during the last lecture. Uh, you remember we uh, described the propagation of a of a plane wave uh, along the x direction. And we uh, wrote that uh, the electric field associated to a plane wave propagating along the x direction can be uh, written in such a, a, a way uh, provided we are taking into account uh, an harmonic wave. So this is our representation for an harmonic plane wave. Um, you remember, always uh, take uh, into account in your mind that you write the electric field in such a complex uh, notation, but you always keep in mind that you have to take the imaginary part. That is the, the real electric field that is associated is the imaginary part of this complex number that is This expression here. And we defined uh, what is the wave number, K. We defined the angular frequency and the relationships between them. Okay. This is what we had, uh, we did, uh, we described last time. Now it is uh, clear to understand that uh, if, if at a certain time t, okay. At a fixed the time t, you want to know the value of the electric field on this plane, and this plane crosses the axis in a certain point with the coordinate x. So x has the same value everywhere on the plane. You see here that inside the sinus function the phase that is here, if x is fixed and t is fixed, is a constant. So the electric field gets the same value all over the plane. This is definition of the plane wave. Okay. Now, uh, we want to ask uh, ourselves, uh, what about if a, a plane wave is not propagating uh, along uh, the x direction, but is propagating uh, along uh, a, another direction, okay? And, and think that this direction is uh, identified by a verso, so a unit vector that is pointing a dot in that direction. Therefore, we ask ourselves, uh, how can I write the expression of a plane wave that is propagating along this direction? And keeping in mind that this must be a wave that gets the same value 
all over the plane perpendicular to the direction of propagation, okay? The smart engineer has no problem because he turns the reference system. He says, okay, I rotate the reference system and put X along the direction of propagation and go back to the previous uh, slide. No, of course you can do it, but if you have two waves, say one that is going along that direction and another one that is going along this direction and you need to use the same reference system, you cannot flip it every moment, okay? Now, how do you write uh, the expression of the plane wave? In such a case, we shall write that the electric field associated with the plane wave. And now, since we are not anymore along the X axis, but we are in the space, we have to put here in a certain point identified by vector here, who is R, is the vector that is identifying the position of a point where you want to calculate the field. And now, how do you write uh, this plane wave? Uh, it is very simple because you simply do this. You substitute to the factor kx in the exponent of the uh, complex field, the expression k dot x, that is the scalar product between k and uh, the position. Now, this quantity that now is a vectorial quantity is named wave vector. And this wave vector is a number that has got a modulus that is the wave number that we defined uh, in the previous lecture. So K and the direction and the verse are the direction and the verse of this unit vector M. Remember that if you are in a medium, K is two pi over lambda, the wavelength. And here you got this. Why do you write uh, the plane wave? I'm uh, sorry, in this, in this type of approach, what is the key vector? Is a vector that is pointing along the direction of propagation in whose modulus is two pi over lambda. Now, why do we write the expression of the play wave in such a way? Because you remember what it comes from geometry in first year of physics engineer courses or say mathematical analysis. If you write this expression here, K dot R equal to a constant, this is the equation of a plane in the space. This is equation of the plane perpendicular to K, okay? Why? Because you see, this is your K vector here. Did you see, this is your R number. Any point that is on the surface of this plane, say another point here, P, sorry, I made a mistake, it's not a vector, P, uh, e prime point here, it will be uh, identified by an R prime vector and the scalar product between R prime and K is the same if you are on the same plane, okay? Therefore, this is the, ex the expression of, a, of the plane that is perpendicular to K. Along this plane, this term is constant that means that if you are on that plane at a certain time t, the phase of the field is constant and the field gets the same value, okay? So from now on, we will generally represent a plane wave in such, in such an expression, okay? What we have to remember is 
the expression here, okay? And we introduce the concept of wave vector. Now, we, we recall that uh, from um, general physics courses, one can define an instantaneous intensity of an electromagnetic wave. So we can define an instantaneous intensity. And now we see to define the instantaneous intensity. If you have a, a wave that is propagating in space and you take a, a surface and the and you the surface as a um, an area that is ds and you calculate how much energy crosses this first surface per unit time so for example you wait for a time dt the so-called instantaneous intensity is the energy that crosses your surface per unit time okay and this Intensity, therefore, is measured in joule divided by square meters per second. Okay. Since the ratio between joules and seconds is watts, this is measured in watt per square meter. So this is the instantaneous intensity that crosses a surface okay now in electromagnetic waves we don't find out normally you write the expression for the pointing vector and then you calculate the flux of this pointing vector to a surface and blah 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 and so on and so on you write down that the instantaneous intensities that is a function of time so it may change uh, second by second instant by instant is epsilon v the square of the electric field associated to your wave and when i write the square i mean the instantaneous field okay function of t so for example in a, a harmonic wave okay uh, harmonic uh, a plane wave we would have that this intensity is epsilon v the amplitude sinus square kx plus or minus omega t if this is propagating along the x direction the simple so so the intensity is changing uh, second after second at certain time can be zero can be maximum intermediate value so there is a time dependent flux across your surface now if you are in vacuum then you have as a prefactor this prefactor here is the, the electric constant of vacuum times the speed of light in vacuum if you are in a medium Then here you have epsilon naught, epsilon r, so the dielectric constant of your medium that it changes by a factor that is the relative dielectric constant. And you have the speed of light in your medium that is written like that, okay? It's C divided by the refractive index, okay? So depending whether you are in vacuum or in medium, you get the this is the instantaneous intensity okay one uh, quantity that is relevant for us is the average intensity the mean intensity what does it mean if i want to know uh, in average, in time, how much energy crosses my 
uh, my surface and then I can define it by means of the mean theorem. I can integrate the instantaneous intensity along a period divided by the period the duration and I have the average or the mean of my function, time dependent function. Remember that this is a time dependent function. Now, if you don't have an harmonic wave, very complicated time dependency, then it will be a complicated integral, but you, you ask MATLAB and it will calculate, okay? If you have a harmonic plane wave, it gets very simple. So for a harmonic a wave, so at a single frequency omega, then the mean intensity is simply one half epsilon v, the amplitude of the electric field, be careful now, the quantity that it is here is, remember, the electric field in an harmonic wave is written like this. The quantity that you get here is this here, the amplitude, okay? And this one, one half uh, factor comes from the average in time of the sinus square function. So this is the average intensity that you get in an electromagnetic wave, okay? Now, to give you a figure, okay? If you are at the surface of Earth, Okay, at the surface of our beloved Earth, and you get sun coming from a clear sky, it is a clear day, the average intensity, of course, in the case of the sun, the radiation is not harmonic because you have several different uh, frequencies, different colors of the sun, and also infrared and also ultraviolet, okay? But the average intensity is more or less one kilowatt per square meter. What does it mean? That you, if you take one surface with one meter of surface, every second you have one kilojoule of, power, of energy going through. This is the so-called solar constant. Okay, I think this is clear. Now we come, we go back to the question that your colleague asked during the last lecture. And she said, but is the plane wave real? Does it exist a perfect plane wave? Of course not. Why? Because this is the intensity, no? Energy per square meter per second. Think you have a, a plane wave and then this, pl uh, this plane is infinitely extended over y and over z, over the two dimensions. Clearly, if you integrate the mean intensity all over the surface, what should you get? Should you get the power that is going through the surface, the average power? Because remember, this is, this is a, a watt per square meter. This is square meters. Okay, so you get the power. But clearly, if you integrate a constant intensity all over an infinite plane, this diverges. So a plane a wave would carry an infinite power. And that says to you that it doesn't exist. Okay, so somewhere, this mathematical approximation must end up and somewhere this wave must uh, bend, okay, must, must finish somewhere, okay?
So that is the why we can introduce the second simplest way that, that we can think of. What is the second simplest wave that comes to your mind? A plane wave is a, as a symmetry, okay, flat. What is the second simplest? A spherical wave. What, what is a spherical wave? is a, a wave that is originating in a source, in a point-like source, that is emitting power all over directions, okay? How, how do you represent a spherical wave? In a spherical wave, the field will depend on the distance from the source. So, so here you get R. Be careful, this is the modulus of the vector. So every point on the surface will have the same R, okay? And how is it written? The plane wave, you write like this, the amplitude, we write e, A naught divided by R, the distance from the source times this factor here, that is the same that we used before, but there is a difference with respect to the plane wave. Here, you haven't anymore the dot product, the scalar product between K and R, but you have the simple product, K, R. So what does it mean? What is the surface that has got K, R constant? provided k is fixed. What is the surface kr constant? It's a sphere. So all over a sphere with a given r, the phase will be the same and the field will be the same, okay? And in this plane wave, the amplitude of the wave decreases as a function of distance. So the more you are far from the source, the more the electric field gets small. Okay, now if we use the definition of average intensity, now what is the average intensity at a certain distance R from the source? This one half the electric constants times the propagation speed times the amplitude of the wave. Now the amplitude of the wave is this one to the square root of two, okay? And now if you ask yourself, how much is it, the average power that is crossing this surface at a certain time, the average power is simply the average intensity, so energy per unit surface, per unit time, times the surface of the sphere, but this is one half epsilon V. Let me write like this. This is A naught squared divided by half, and the surface of the sphere is four pi R squared. And then what does it magically happen? the R squared goes away, and the average power is one half epsilon V A naught squared times four pi. And if you take a second sphere, it has got the same center, but a larger R, the power that crosses this surface is the same. So in a spherical wave, the power that crosses any surface is the same. That preserves power and makes that in principle what you have to expect that the real physical wave is the spherical wave emitted by a point light. Clearly, to come back to your friend, if you look to 
to a portion of a spherical wave locally. This portion can be approximated by a flat plane. And so locally, you can approximate as a plane wave. And the approximation is uh, better and better, the larger it is the distance from the source. If you have at a large distance from a source, the wave will be almost plane. Okay? If you are close to the source, you will see that there is a, a strong spherical shape. Okay? So this resumes our knowledge about intents. The formulas that we have to keep in mind now are that, uh, let me see, uh, revise them here. So an harmonic plane wave will be represented like this. A spherical wave, let's say, An harmonic spherical wave will be represented like this. Like this. The instantaneous intensity will be given by And the average intensity is given by, is not anymore time dependent, is written like this. Okay? Now, please remember that this factorial epsilon b can be written like epsilon c. And you remember when we wrote the uh, wave equation, okay, uh, we have that the refractive index is given by the square root of a Epsilon me, remember this? Uh, we, we wrote like this. Then you can then write this like the square root of epsilon over me. Uh, uh, times uh, C. Okay, should be right. Okay, and then you can write that means that the instantaneous intensity can be written like C over square root of me over. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm wrong. That's the way I was puzzled. I'm making a mistake. There is no C here. The speed of propagation is one over this quantity here. I'm, I'm wrong. This is not here. This is not here. And this is this quantity here. So you can work out this. And this quantity here is known by the electromagnetic people, people working in electromagnetics is known as capital zeta. And this capital zeta is the square root of the ratio of the magnetic permittivity and the dielectric permittivity of the medium in which you are propagating. Okay. 
if you are in vacuum vacuum then this quantity is named zeta naught because we refer to vacuum with naught and this is the square root of mi naught divided epsilon naught and this is 377 ohm and this is named the impedance of vacuum okay now there was uh, the, a very important uh, physicist working uh, at fermilab uh, in chicago and uh, his name was lieberman and he he, um, he worked on the discovery of the zeta zero particle and he wrote a book in this book is named the particle of god probably you heard about this okay and it is the description of all the research and in this book there are very funny stories that he says and he says uh, look if you are a physicist and you come from a, some country in the world to get you get in new york at, at the airport you take the underground or the train and you get a central station and they steal your luggage they punch you they take all over your all your money and wallet and you don't have a cellular phone you are alone in new york you have no money so you are lost you are a poor that you can die there then if you are a physicist if you take a piece of paper and write on this piece of paper the, the hyperfine constant for the separation of the levels in the atom uh, one over 137 or something 137 you write this hyperfine constant and you put, go on your knees on the platform of the train and take this there will be a physicist that will pass by there and he will help you so if it will happen to you to get lost in new york that they punch you they take your wallet if you write this on a piece of paper and you get on your knees somebody will understand you are a poor engineer who has been robbed out okay and they will surely help you because this is for engineers a universal number it's like pi for mathematicians mathematicians know pi until the 20th digit if you write pi to the 20th digit they will realize that you know something in your life okay but this is more specific so this is to resume the intensity of a wave now this comes from classical electromagnetism okay so what does it mean it means that you, if you have for the sake of simplicity uh, sorry an harmonic wave with a certain time dependency it means that if you increase the amplitude of the electric field okay this is what he named not if you increase the amplitude the average intensity or the instantaneous intensity increases uh, quadratically okay so in classical electromagnetism you turn a knob you increase the intensity the amplitude and you get more intensity this is a wave view of light but already newton didn't think like that newton already in the 17th century he had in mind that light was made out of bullets 
of particles. So Newton had in mind that okay, the light is constituted by a flux of particles that are flowing in a certain direction. Okay? Then when you get a surface, what is relevant for you is the number of particles that are passing through your surface, per unit surface and per unit time. Okay? So the average intensity or the mean intensity, we call it, the mean intensity can also be defined in such a way think you have a wave at a certain frequency so we are, you have an harmonic wave with a fixed frequency mean then the average intensity is h me so the Planck constant times the frequency of the wave and this is the energy of the photons that are constituting your light beam so if you have a laser at a certain frequency, you know that light is not propagating in a continuous way, but it is propagated by quanta. This is a flux of quanta. And the quantum of the electric field, of the electromagnetic field is H mu. Then if you write here, the mean and what is the mean N? Is the average number of photons that are crossing your surface per unit time. So the intensity can also be written like this, though. This ever is the mean photon number crossing the unit surface per unit time. Okay, this is the definition in, let's say, the quantum description of light. We don't make quantum optics. We just cite very small results, okay? Now, what does it mean? I calculated a couple of numbers. It means that if you have visible light okay say for example wavelength 600 nanometers this is the wavelength of orange light orange color then the energy of one photon is uh, h me but we remember we know that the frequency is the speed of light divided by the wavelength, we given this number. Then in this particular case, this is 662 10 to the minus 34, this is the Planck constant, times the speed of light in vacuum, 3, 10 to the eight meters per second, divided the wavelength that is 600 nanometers, 10 to the minus nine, meters and if you calculate this this is 3.3 10 to the 19 minus 19 sorry joule so one photon in a light beam that has got a frequency a wavelength of 600 nanometer brings an energy that is 3.3 10 to the minus 19 joule okay that means that if you have that this beam has a power, uh, sorry, an average intensity of one watt per square meter, so one over 1,000, then we stop here. If you have this, you can write that this, this is, uh, 
energy of a photon. And then you work out that this average number of photons crossing your surface is the average intensity divided by energy of the photon. That is one watt divided 3.3 10 to the minus 19. And so you get here about three 10 to the 18 photons per uh, square meter per second. Okay. So in the light beam with the um, intensity of one watt per square meter, you get such number of photons, 10 to the 18. If you have the sun, the solar constant is one kilowatt. You have ten. You have a thousand more. Thousand more photons crossing. Okay. So we stop here for a while because I have a meeting with Professor Casciola. Questions after the break, and I give you a quarter of an hour break. Okay. <laughs>